Welcome into Unbreakable, a mental wealth podcast with Jay Glazer. I'm Jay Glazer. And if you're like many people, you may be surprised to learn that one in five adults in this country experienced mental illness last year. Yet far too many fail to receive the support they need. Carolyn Behavioral Health is doing something about it. They understand that behavioral health is a key part of whole health, delivering compassionate care that treats physical, mental, emotional, and social needs in tandem. Carolyn Behavioral Health, raising the quality of life through empathy and action. All right, welcome into Unbreakable, a mental wealth podcast with Jay Glazer. And man, I am bringing on somebody today who you all know, who you think you know, but you don't know. And man, he is uh, somebody I've gotten very close to at Fox. He is one of the voices of Fox. He's one of the voices of the NFL. He is the voice of baseball. He is, I wish he was the voice in my head when the roommates of my head talk, because then I, it calmed me down quite a bit. But he is leading our NFL coverage here, and that's the one and only Kevin Burkhart. How are you, brother? Blaze, uh, great, man. I, it t- it's tough to live up to that introduction, but uh, it's, always, <laughs> it's always good to be with you, brother. You know that when we get a chance to spend some time together. No doubt, man. I, dude, I love spending time with you, and you and I really got to bond down at uh, in Tampa a couple of years ago at the Super Bowl. and yeah, Because you know, I, I think you and I have, and, and you know, I want people to hear this. He and I both have a similar story as far as, our journey was so wild getting here and both it started for Jersey with, with the both of us. Right. Yep, yep. Right. And just wild how we got here and people think, Oh, you know, you may have just seen Kevin. It's an overnight success. Y'all got no idea that overnight success for him was what, like 30 years. So <laughs> took a minute. Right? It's a, it, it took quite a minute. You know, I was making 9,500 bucks a year for the first 11 years of my career, but you know, I want to hit a lot of things with you, but I want you to take us back to where you were, how it started, because you weren't doing this. You were selling cars, right? Yeah, yeah. It goes back. Uh, <laughs> it goes back a bit, and 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 you're right. We had a great time. It, it was fun. That yeah. you know, when we were down at the Super Bowl, like you know, we had known each other obviously as as you know coworkers, acquaintances. Right. But that was really cool getting to dive into each other's world, spending time. I feel like we really bonded. So uh, no doubt. that was great. Um, yeah, you know. Hey, so- hey, by, by the way, Kevin. If he, if you, you hear him on the broadcast and you're like, man, this guy seems like a good guy. He's a better person than you even think. Oh, so yeah. that's the authenticity. And I think people, that's a big thing because people have the choice. Who do they want to bring in to their living room? Right. More so with us with a pregame show, but it's still a choice of, Hey, I, I choose to bring this person into my living room each week to hear what they have to say. And you by far, I think people look at and go, man, we wish this guy was sitting in our living room, having a cocktail with us watching this game. That's how I always think, right? I always think right. of it that way. And obviously, as a as a studio host too, like I always feel like the best way, like a, you got to be you, and b, like you want to have it so people watching want to sit at the bar and have a beer with you and watch right. the game or whatever it is. Like that, that's the best compliment anyone could ever give to yeah. me. Um, so that's kind of the mindset. And as far as your question goes, Glaze, yeah, like you know, there is. Um, you said this. Uh, you've said this many a time in, in just life, but you said it on this podcast too. It's just like it's embracing the journey. If I go way, way back, you know, I, I was just like you. I was doing minor league baseball games for twenty five dollars a game. I was doing, you wow. know, working at a small radio station, doing high school sports. My first job out of college, making, I, I mean, you know, ridiculously low pay, just struggling to pay the rent, that type wow. of thing. But you just kind of kept trying to work the way up. But I I had a hard time working the way up. You know, it's hard. I got a lot of no responses, a lot of no's, um, just things like that. So I did a lot of small, lower level jobs like that, minor league baseball, anything I get my hands on. And then finally, basically, in a nutshell, after, you know, a good amount of time, I don't know, eight years, I want to say out of college, I was just like, uh, this, I mean, I can't just keep, I can't keep making 18 grand a year. I gotta, like at some point I gotta be an adult and, you know, actually pay for things and, you know, um, that type of thing. So I just decided to kind of quit and sell cars. I literally took out the Sunday newspaper when we actually got newspapers delivered, not on our iPhones. And I like put my finger on a job and was selling cars, which I had obviously no clue what I was doing, but I walked in and the general manager was like, okay, have you ever done this before? No. All right. You start tomorrow. Great. Walk, <laughs> walked in, you know, like, you know, here, here's that. It was a Chevy dealership. Here you go. Study out on all the cars. So I'm just like studying about all the cars and just figured it out. And um, it was a life changing uh, moment for me. I spent about a little less than a year doing it, but it, it shaped me in a lot of different ways. And that huh. kind of spurred me on to kind of. How, how, how did it shape you? 
Well, it shaped me because it just quite it, it just brought me back to ground zero. Okay, what do I want? What do what do I want to do here? What what's like what's my next step? And I think like you know, I am pretty laid back, as you know, and I think a lot of times it's just like, yeah, sure, like, um, you want to do that, great, or okay, sorry about that, you know, where this just, if you don't go and ask someone for a sale, you're not going to put food on your table. So it got me in the habit of asking for things that I wanted. Um, and worse, people could say, worse, you could say is no, who cares right. if it's no, you know, so I just started right, calling listen. up people in the, in the industry, like, hey, like, I want to come in and, and work for you, or I think I'm good enough to work for you. I did that at WFAN to Eric Spitz, who was the program director of the station. Hey, so did I. In night, same guy in 1989. Yep. And got I an mean, internship. Yeah. And I, yeah. I said, hey, I think I'm good enough, but I, I, you know, I just, I want to, he's like, okay, come in on, come in and you can do an audition on Friday. I'm like, what? You know, so it just kind of gave me a perspective of almost like, fuck it. Like if, you know, if worst people could say is no, start asking for things that you want and, and just have a different outlook on everything. So that process, I didn't have that in my life before I did that. And so it, it was a great reset for me to allow me just to rethink how I was approaching things. How are you as a car salesman? You know, I didn't sell the most cars, but I actually, <laughs> no joke. I had the number one customer satisfaction rating of the store. <laughs> that doesn't surprise me. So the people that, that bought from me were happy. I didn't, I didn't make the most money, but I did. Okay. Glaze. Because you weren't the slimy car salesman. I'm no, no, I did. No, I, right. I, good, I good. It's funny because when I left, and my, uh, my boss at the time, now one of my really good friends, was like, he's like, you want to know something? He's like, we just got the customer service back. You were number one in the store. So I was like, all right, at least I did something right. Okay, you know? good. All right. So then, what got you, um, out of the car business and like your first gig, in our job? What really got me going is that, so at the time, like I was doing very rare occasion fill-ins for WCBS AM in New York, like doing their sports an anchors, like sports updates for them. And it was like, you know, I needed like four people to get sick and another person to go on vacation to get like a, a shift. So that whole process, like I called up Eric Spitz, got in, he started giving me some shifts at the fan. I ended up going to CBS and getting more shifts. And eventually I became like the afternoon uh, sports anchor there. And then that got me going. Then it got me like really into the New York market, which I really wasn't before. I was just doing super small stuff locally in Jersey. Um, and it but got still, me. But still, by the way, CBS radio in New York is still not a big thing, like the sports thing, right? It's still not yeah. a huge. It, people have to understand that this part of this journey, folks, is still you're like, oh, wow, we got a CBS radio. No, no, no. People aren't tuning in to CBS radio for sports in New York. No, right. no, no, no. It, it was it was a huge break for me at the time, right. no question. But like, yeah, it's not like it's not the bastion of sports. CBS Radio is certainly, you know, it's one of the you know more respected outlets in the right. city. But it's 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 more news, right? right. So, right. but it did at least get me into the world. It got me right. into like the New York world and meeting people and like being on the map, and that helped, please. Okay. And then we'll continue from there. Yeah. So then <laughs> that happened. And then, you know, then I started getting more shifts at WFAN. And then I started really getting out there and, and going to these Wait, games. shifts as the update guy or shifts as hosting? Uh, I did really updates and reporting. And then uh, it kind of broke where they brought me over and, and they kind of created this hybrid role for me. I was going to be the reporter for the Jets. Um, I was going to do updates and then do fill in talk show hosts, which I love because I love doing multiple things, which, you know, I still do now. I really... Yeah like being able to do different things and that's kind of what started me on this path down to like versatility i was hosting shows i was doing updates i was reporting um and it was awesome. i loved it i mean i grew up dreaming about being on wfa and listening yeah. to you know everybody from steve summers to john minko to mike and chris yep. i mean you name it so that was like a dream come true for me getting in the door and getting to be in that world and you know i felt like i made it but it, that part wouldn't happen if i didn't sell the cars and i didn't change my whole thought process and, and just you know success life what's important right. you know how to ask for things all that came yeah. with that change now i want people to hear this because I, I started fan also as an intern I, like my first thing was interning at lifestyles of the rich and famous with robin leach oh yeah yes and i got fired or quit in like three or four weeks um because of my <laughs> mouth um and then got a, a job logging tape at at uh CBS for 50 bucks a game. And I was trying stand up comedy in the city. And that got me an internship at FAM. And, and I want everybody here to hear this, especially like any aspiring broadcaster or anybody aspiring in anything. 
when I got my internship through Eric Spitz at WFM, yeah. I decided, okay, I'm going to stand out. I'm going to ask to do things. And because we're all now that I've you know, been an entrepreneur, I, I realized too, like, man, we're all looking for good help. We're all looking for somebody who will stand up. So I always tell young guys, <laughs> don't just be a face in the crowd. Like start a crowd, be your own crowd, stand up. So I would ask them, hey, can I go to this press conference? They're like, well, we don't, like a boxing press conference. And they're like, well, we're not, we're not covering it. But yeah, if you want to, sure, we'll, we'll credential you. And I would just go over there and start asking questions, right? And it wasn't going to be anywhere. Or I would, I would have to cut the tape for guys like you who are doing uh, updates. I would yeah. have to go learn how to cut the tape and put them together. So when you were doing an update, and they said, "All right, let's hear what you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, who, who's a who's a whatever." Herm Edwards, but yeah, hurry yeah. Let's yeah. let's hear what the Giants' coach has to say, right? And there's a 10 second clip. I would be the one cutting them together with, like, cutting them literally like strips of tape, right? That's been recorded, like it's not digital like it is now. And I'd have to literally tape them together. So you oh, would I have to have your days. right, yeah. So that's what I was doing. But I would stand out and I, I offered to be on the WFN softball team. And I, my job would be to run for Mike Francesa. Okay. So <laughs> yes, that's amazing. Right. Yes. I, I asked to go to the draft. I would take Francesa to the bathroom. So fans wouldn't stop him so he can get back in time for the next yeah. pick. Like those are my jobs. So I want people to understand that stand out as a result. I was one of, I think five people who got a second internship at FAN. And those other five people were like, Todd Fritz, who's on Dan Patrick's show. I think Steve Levy might have been one of them. And I, I think, I don't know if Ian Eagle was an intern also there, but obviously he's done a lot. I've worked a lot I with him. I thought Ian was, but I could yeah, be wrong. I think he did like two of them also. There's only been a few of us. And we all stood out. So stand out is, the, is my point here to everybody in, not just in sports, but any business. Stand out. Just don't, don't just be a face in the crowd because you'll just kind of get passed over. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Like, and like, and, and I get it. Like, there's a fine line, right? Like, because you, you don't want to be a pain, and you you don't mm-hmm. want to get on. People think this guy's uh, so annoying, right? But you have to make your mark. You have to be you and make your mark. Right. I get so many people, younger people or college students, they ask me like, you know, how can I do this? Or I'm trying to be like this person. You can be inspired by that person, but don't try to be anybody. Like, you got to be you. You got to do your thing. And like to your point, like it's funny. Like when I got that job at WFAN, I was kind of crafting the role. And I was just trying to do stuff and expand my palate and, and, and learn and, and, you know, be out there. So I was like, hey, I, I want to, you know, I want to start covering the Rangers, you know, whatever, the Knicks when they're home, whatever. Right. So, you know, Mark Chernoff, who was, you know, a head of the operations at the time. And he was there, uh, I think, when you were there, too. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Was, he was ahead of you. He's like, all right, but we're not going to cover parking. So, you know, I would go park on Ninth Avenue and try right. to find a spot because I would pay more for parking than I was getting paid for the night to cover right. the Rangers. Right, 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 right. <laughs> but, but you know what? Like, you you, you yep. love it and you do it. And it was great experience. And like, it's it's yeah. I mean, I wouldn't get, I wouldn't trade any of it for right. the world. It got me here. And then, all right. So now, like again, we still got to get to the jump. How you got to national TV? Yeah. So, you know, being at, you know, first it was CBS and then being at WFAN, that really people heard you and saw, you know, and at, at a point when I was there, they were, they signed a deal to be on TV with the Yes Network, not the whole day, but right. Mike and the Mad Dog were on TV. So if you did updates during their show, you were on TV, even albeit for, you know, a minute and a half, a couple of times an hour. But like that was a big thing. Right. Um, and I did TV. I always wanted to be on television. Like, that's what I did in college. I did all TV classes and I, you know, a communication major. And we, I did the campus TV station, all of our games. So I had always been a radio person my whole post-college life, but I always wanted to get back into TV. And that kind of spurred it. I started getting some, like, just some, you know, appearances on, you know, ESPN Classic or different things. I was covering the Jets. So it was come on, talk the NFL a little bit. And then SNY was formed, which is the Mets, essentially the Mets network um in new york and they had jets programming so i went on there and did like some appearances and then one day the host was six says hey can you come on and help host the show we're in a bind and so that kind of spurred the tv stuff and then the second year of their existence um their uh, sideline person chris cotter who now you know has done games at espn for a right. while he moved on he didn't um want to do the sideline role it wasn't his goal and that job opened up and I interviewed for it. I didn't think I had a chance at it a million years because I had zero TV experience, but I got it. And, mm-hmm. you know, for me, the advantage for me was I grew up in the area. I grew up a Mets fan. I knew the history in and out. And I, you know, I started in, you know, I was in New York for a while. So 
it that part wasn't new. The job was new, but that is the springboard how I got there. Once I got to the fan, it happened pretty quick. It just was the journey. You know, I when did I? I mean, I got the SNY job what at thirty three or something. I, I'm so bad with years, right, but right. but I appreciate the time from that took me to got there. I wouldn't have, I wouldn't change it. I I'm glad it took me like all the time and all the roller coasters and the curvy sure. work roads to get there. I think it made made me who I am. Um, you don't have a, an accent. Did you work to get? So when I signed with people don't know this, when I signed with Fox, they got me a voice broadcast coach. Cause I really was, I was talking like this. Hey, no, we got these uh, three guys over here. Right. And, you know, I was really talking like I'll a New Yorker. Yeah, I got the, I'm getting, I was talking like a New Yorker and they're like, Oh, like people in Nebraska are going to hate you. So they, they got a coach for me to talk where I don't have a New York accent anymore. Did you work at that? Did you not have one? Like, Get a get a couple of cocktails in me, and as uh, as, <laughs> as you know, as John Lynch uh, used to say when we worked together, the Jer- Jersey KB will come out. Jersey you know KB, I mean? right? <laughs> the uh, so actually, it's funny. Um, you know, I I did work out. I had a class in college, though. I had a um, when this okay. was something that I wanted to do. I had a, a great class, a phonetics class, which okay. I don't know that it's available. I don't know if that's a common thing in schools, but so we had this teacher who was amazing, and he was not from the Northeast, and he was like. It was as simple as you get a sentence. Okay, the sad lamb has, you know, right, and I'm right. like, this is, I can't do this. And he was so good. And he was on me the whole class. And by the time I got done with that class, like, it wasn't every day. Like, I still have an accent on certain words and things. But it got me out of it. It got wow, me out of yeah. the accent. So, yeah, I mean, it's it, it's still in there, Glaze. You know what I mean? Like, you probably saw when we were down in, uh, down in Tampa. But um, <laughs> that's what helped me. Like, yeah. I think... I think everyone needs like, you know, especially if you're from a region like that or, you know, with, with, I think it's pretty common to get some kind of help. I got, I got turned down, but I think two agents, uh, when I was trying to just find an agent who said, Nope, you're too New York. You'll never make it nationally. Like no one will ever, ever put you like, accept you uh, for a national job. And, uh, one of them came back and I'm, I'm friendly with one of them. And he said, it's the biggest fuck up we ever had. <laughs> like we, it's the biggest fuck up we just never saw past it. That yeah, you can you can make it work nationally. Yeah, I got I had I had an agent back in the day who said that I wasn't uh, good enough to do play by play. So I've had that one on the pegboard right. for a right. while. Yeah, 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 yeah. You keep that one sitting right there. Absolutely. Uh-huh. I don't so mind then, it. It, it, it. It fires you up. I like it. So then you're doing Mets, and then but you made a big jump from the Mets to to us. Mets to Fox. Yeah. So right. later in doing the sideline role for the Mets. And then like I started doing play-by-play fill-in um, our, our guy right. who's, who's still there. Gary Cohen is one of the best oh, yeah, sure. that, that, that's ever done it. Legend. It's, yes. Legend. So I, he I grew up a, listening to them. Yeah. Of course. So he, yeah, he was radio for those who don't know. He was, did the radio for the Mets forever. And then when SNY formed, he did the TV and he's done that for uh same thing. So um, he didn't miss many games, but when he did, I would fill in and I would do like the spring training games. And we had some minor league games on our air that I would do. And, um, it came, I don't know what year this was, but maybe I was at SMY for eight years. So maybe four years in somehow I got a Fox uh, chance to do like one of our Saturday game of the weeks on Saturday. Like they needed a guy and it was a Mets game. So they asked me to do it, which was a, obviously a huge moment. So, right. um, I jumped in and, uh, you know, Bill Webb, the, the late Bill Webb, rest in peace. who was one of my mentors, um, director for the world series forever for Fox. He did it for the Mets and for Yankees. He helped me and, you know, Carol Langley, who was my producer that day, just kind of helped me like, okay, here's how to like do baseball for Fox. And here's the Fox way. And this is the way we like to go about things. And it was so good. So I did that. And I guess I did it okay enough because I did a couple more of those. And then um, before the 2013 season, that's when stuff kind of happened about me going to Fox. And initially the talk was they're going to give me college football and do like some kind of college football play-by-play package. So I was so psyched. I was still working for the Mets. And um, and it somehow turned around in a really quick amount of time that I went from that to doing the number two package with John Lynch. Um, and I was like, huh, <laughs> what? <laughs> um, so it was one of the greatest calls of my life. Wow. And, uh, you know, I broke down crying when I got it. Good. And, I love to hear that. Oh, my gosh. I mean, it's like you know, everything you dream of as yeah. a kid and you get that call. And I it was I was incredible. I was incredulous. So 2013, I did the NFL on Fox. And I was still doing the Mets, but, you know, a little bit of overlap, but it was fine. And then the next year, the talk was to go to Fox full time. 
Wait, wait, did you, more... did you start? Because Lynchy didn't start until number two guy, right? He started. He like Lynchy, four Lynchy worked with five, right? Lin, yeah, Lynchy worked with uh, D Stock. He worked with Dick Stock. Oh, with the, Dick Stock, legend. Dick Stock. Okay, right. Um, he may have worked with Ron Pitts for a year or two. Um, but yeah, John was there before me. Okay. But when I got then when they decided to move him up to number two, they, they put us together. Okay. Yeah, yeah, which okay. was as you know, he's the okay. greatest, right. the, the best, greatest yeah. guy ever. And then 2014, there's talking about me doing full time and doing baseball and football and other stuff and. I still did Mets, so I was kind of like bi-coastal. And then after the 2014 Mets season, I moved out here, and I've been a Cali guy and lucky to be full-time right. at Fox, which has been amazing. Do you – all right, so now, you know, I think we're airing this probably going into the NFC Championship game. Yeah. Um, do you ever get – do you, do you approach things like the NFC Championship game, the Super Bowl, the World Series, differently – Oh, it's for people who don't know. He's the host of the World Series. He's not. He's our number one play-by-play guy at Fox for, you know, Super Bowls and and NFC Championship games and on and on and on. Um, do you try and make it like, hey, just another game, which I think is full of shit for people to say. But do you try and make it like that, or uh, do you approach it differently? Do you get up for it differently? Give Give me the Kevin Burkhart attack for those premier things that you're doing. Yeah, I think. Look, I agree with you. It's it's not just another game. I mean, right. you know, and you know, look when when Joe and Troy went to ESPN and it, uh, it allowed uh, you know Greg and I to elevate to the to the one team. You know, I've done I had done you know a decade of football at Fox, so the games weren't new to me. I've done the World Series and, and hosted that for you know and handed handed away the trophy in the World Series, which is about as nerve wracking as it gets. So it's not just another game. But I will say this, Glaze. Like I know, of course, you know in your head, like. Last year, we're doing Cowboys Niners divisional. Monstrous. You know, you're doing Thanksgiving, which, like, for me, like, as a kid growing up, we, like, we we loved watching Thanksgiving games and Pat and John. And, and then when you do the Super Bowl, I got to tell you, like, doing that for the first time, I truly, it was the week leading up that had me anxious. It wasn't the game. Like, it, as crazy as it sounds, I know, you know, 115 million people watched it, but it was just getting to the game. It was the anxiety of, like, staying healthy, not getting sick, making sure you're taking care of all your prep, like doing X, Y, and Z and all the other stuff that comes along with Super Bowl week, as you've done a million times. It was all of that. And I felt like, of course, there's pressure. Like you go into that, you know, like if you handle it, like, you know, you feel great about yourself, you're in a good spot. And if you don't, it could kill your career. It's a a lot of pressure. Right, right, right. So I will say though, Sunday, when I woke up like the day of the game, I felt so good. My mind was clear. And it just felt like, okay, it's a normal, right. I've done a million of these games. There's just more people watching this one. And, and it, and that, at that point, it did feel like another game to me. So hmm. I would say everything else leading up to it, if you say it's another game, I agree, it's horseshit, it's not. Right. But if you approach it differently, like if your prep is different, and if you think about it differently, and you psych yourself up right. in a different way, I think you fail. I, I, I can't, I, I take the same approach and the same excitement, and this I mean, I take the same approach and the same excitement level for our preseason game as I do as I did for the big playoff games because I don't know any other way I, I I don't I can't cheat on the test I can't skimp on prep I, I'm just not wired that way so right. that's what helps me you know what my first and tell me you know how you kind of approach this my first tv stand-up I ever did was the Patriots uh Packers Super Bowl in 95 in New Orleans and New York One TV told me, we'll give you, we'll have you, you could do three stand ups from down there and we'll give you $150 to stand up. So it's the first time I ever did like a report, but yeah. we, we won't pay for you to go down there. You got to get yourself down there. We're not going to pay for you to stay anywhere. You have to stay. So, man, I just bummed rides and bummed couches and literally didn't have money for food. I ate in the press room and then waited for the parties at night. Um, but so you're sitting there, I'm outside the Superdome, but I'm like, man, there's two ways I could look at this. I could either really be scared right now and just shit my pants, or I shifted my mindset the whole time I'm doing it. All I'm thinking about is how great I'm going to feel when I crush this. Yeah, That's it. Like, the only thing on my mind is, man, you're going to feel amazing once you nail this. Once you get this thing done, you're going to feel amazing. Even the fact that you've done it, you're going to feel amazing. And I just went in with that mindset so I wasn't nervous. What are some of the tools you've used, you know, in instances like that, uh, when the scenes are big? I, 
here's my mindset. It's this. If you can't enjoy this, then what are we even doing? And right. and that doesn't mean that you're not stressed, that you're not nervous, that you right. don't get exhausted. Like that's normal stuff. Like, you know, just because we love what we do and we have an amazing job doesn't mean all of that doesn't come into play because it does. But I mean, reality, like going back to the Super Bowl stuff, I said to myself, if I'm not going to like, of course, nerves and the anxiety and all that. But I'm like, if I'm not going to enjoy this, why have I done this for the last 30 years of my life? Like, this is like everything you know you dream of as a kid of have fun with it and like, right. let the chips fall where they may. Like, I, I'm a firm, I agree with you. I'm a firm believer in that. Like, here's the deal. Go out swinging, be yourself. And then yeah. where things go, they go. That's all. Right. That's the only thing you can control. I can't control if certain things happen, if people like it or if they don't. But I feel good about myself if I'm going to enter it and be me and do it my way. And I think that goes back to the car stuff that I was telling you about. Like that mindset changed that year of here's the deal. If I'm going to go out or if I'm never going to be a success in this business or if whatever, I'm going to do it my way and I'm going to be me. And if that doesn't work this, then I'll do something else. And I still feel the same way. Not that I don't accept um, constructive criticism or coaching or any of that. I love that. I want that. But I, I don't know how you can succeed, especially on camera, when you're on camera all the time, if you don't have the faith and belief in yourself, like this is going right. to be awesome, it's going to be exhilarating, and let's go and enjoy it. I don't yeah. know how you can do it if you don't have that. Yeah, and you know, the other thing I, I do, and I tell coaches, first-time coaches to do the same thing, whenever we're doing something big, like Super Bowl, let's say, or yeah. NFC Championship game, I, um, I go find a little piece on the field by myself. And I literally stop and I look up to God and I say, thank you, my best friend, God Almighty. I cannot believe I'm here. I don't want this moment to be like, oh yeah, I've been there before. No, like, and I sit there and I just literally, I just pray and I'm like, man, I'm so, I can't believe that this little kid who struggled so much is here right now in this moment. And I just live in this gratitude. It's like a minute or two. And I always tell head coaches, do the same thing. You have this huge journey, your first game. Go over, take a little little piece of field, and just look up to God and go, thank you. I'm so grateful. Live in this gratitude. And then every game, just go walk over that piece of field. So to remember just how grateful you should be that it's not like, hey, we're, this is owed to us or, eh, you know, no big deal. No, I always try and to live in gratitude in those moments. And then while I'm doing it, a lot of times I'll think about, all, a, the people who would be so proud of me that they're watching me right now in those big moments. So, you know, usually like my last segment on the Super Bowls was like right before, you know, to my ins and outs or something like, you know, right before the, the guys pick and it's right before we send to you guys, which is the, the height of, of our show. And I'll sit there and A, I'll think about, okay, all the fuckers who passed me by and rejected me and not in a bad way, just like, man, I'm just great. All you guys who rejected me, we're, all, we're cool, but also all the people who are probably really proud seeing me up there knowing how fucking hard I worked and how much rejection I went through. Right. So, you know, yes. with, with that, I'm leading to you. Go ahead. Take it from there. No, it makes you stronger. And like, look, I think, it, and that's part of it, right? I think like, it's all, it's all, you know, how hard you work and, and what you put into it. And hopefully everyone else sees that. Like, um, and I think that's all you can do. Right. And hopefully people, here's the thing. People see how hard you work. People see how you treat others. And people see your overall approach. My approach, I choose to be sunny. I choose to be, you know, kind. And it doesn't mean that every day I'm perfect. Doesn't mean that I won't, you know, get in a bad mood and, you know, bitch at something. I do. I'm human. But I like to think that on 95% of the days, I take the opposite approach. And like, I appreciate so much of what I'm able to do and where I'm at. And not every day's picture perfect, but, um, Hopefully you, you know, you brighten your day and brighten others' days. I got a note the other day from someone who, to be completely honest, I didn't even know I affected them, but I helped them and gave them some advice uh, years ago and sent this nice note out of nowhere. And I was so touched wow. and I didn't think I did anything else, but tried to be nice and tried to be kind, but it really made a difference. So that stuff means more to me. Yeah. And as far as like enjoying the moment, like I do this thing. And it's cheesy, I know. And um, there's no cheesy. Every, no. every football game, before every game, there's a football in the booth that we bring on the truck, and I throw it with my spotter, Mitch, before the game, like 10 minutes before we go on the air. So if the booth isn't big enough, we go out in the hallway. Like a couple weeks ago, we're throwing in the hall, and Dan Quinn comes behind me and you know, wants to <laughs> tackle me, and he's getting ready for the booth for the Cowboys. But it's like 
the reason I got into this is from throwing the football in the street with my dad when I was a kid. I love this. So it kind of takes me back to like, think about that, like your dreams as a kid. And right. now I'm just doing this with my buddy who's my, who's my spotter and just kind of gets all the nervous tension out before we actually go on the air. And I'm like, this is like my dream as a kid. Yeah. And now I'm doing it for real. Like, how bad can it be? Like, it's right. it just, I just appreciate it so much. That's amazing. Give me, I got two more things for you. <clears throat> you work with so many different people in yeah. football and in baseball, so many partners. And a lot of times guys were just starting. What advice do you give partners? Like you, you work with Derek Jeter this year. It's his first year, right? What advice do you give guys, even though they're the superstars, when they first come on? Yeah, it, it's everybody's a little different, right? I mean, but you're right. I mean, there's so many big personalities and, and, you know, like you've been around those kind of guys your whole life. And, mm-hmm. You know, there's a lot of different things of, of what they're feeling going to TV. And the fascinating thing with Derek is that, you know, he was amazing for being in New York all those years and winning all those World Series is that he had a perfect way to be kind and give the yeah. media the time, but never say anything. He's and, the most and, humble superstar I've ever been around in my life. We went to, me and Stray took him to dinner a couple of weeks ago in Solo Malibu. And it's just, yeah, I, I couldn't believe And he came over to the house, said hello to Rosie. It's just like, doesn't act like a superstar at all. He's the so, greatest. Yeah. He's the greatest. Like we yeah. had the best October and the most fun getting to know him. And well, we, you know, it starts with relationships. Like that's, that's where it all starts. Right. And it really, and the right time to be like, Hey, as we get to know each other, just trust me that I'm going to be yeah. there for you and do my best to make sure that you don't fail. That's my number one goal, right? I'm trying to be the point guard here. And, um, you know, we hit it off. We, we hung out in Miami, you know, when, after he got hired and we went and had a great time and, I feel like I knew him forever. And so that one was easy because right. he's easy. He's he's as laid right. back as they come. And, you know, you get to know his style and, and maybe, you know, offer some suggestions. The thing that I always find and, you know, just staying on the baseball set, whether it's him or A-Rod or, or Big Poppy, for these guys being who they are, iconic players, just world superstars, they want to be coached. Yeah. And so, like, who am I? But like, I'll, when I say, Hey, let's, can we try doing this? Or if I do this or, you know, and I try and help them and try to learn what makes them better. They want it. Like they want to be, they want to be coached. And I think that's the cool thing about working with all these superstars is every one of them wants to be great yeah. at it. And they want to be coached and, and help to get there. I, I would tell guys football and UFC. Cause I, I hosted our, our UFC coverage which was the first time these guys really did, you know, desk work ever, these fighters. Yeah. Right. But, but what I told like Strahan, when he first came on, I tell I try and tell every player, but Michael really resonated with. I'm like, look, dude, I'm the insider, so I know more than 99.999999 percent of the world about football. But honestly, I'll never know more than you. I don't know what it's like to be in a locker room with a quarterback controversy, or my head coach getting fired, or to be in a losing streak like that, or to be under a pile where someone's grabbing me, or you know, having to look at certain. Re- I'll never know that. And like these fighters too, like, Hey man, I'm, you know, you're sitting there in a championship fight and you know, you've got, you know, it's a little different. I've had experience in the fight world, but man, a lot of times our guys will get these like research packets. So I always say, don't ever tell me something I could read in a research packet or something I could read in USA today. Give me something that only, you know, so straight. Don't tell me it's, Oh, we got the number one offense first and number two defense. Don't tell me that. Like, give me something from that game. Like, hey, you got you know, the best offense, best defense. When we were the Giants, we had this situation, and this is how we handled it. We had a players-only meeting, and this is what a players-only meeting does to a locker room. Something where you could tell us that I can never tell. Like, impress me on something. So that's always been my advice to these to these players. And I also totally tell them, agree. put in the same work ethic. Every one of you is a star because you outwork the world. Don't just come in here now and broadcast and say, oh, I'm Michael Strahan, so I'm good. No, use your same work ethic. Like all our guys in our show, as crazy as you think, you know, Howie or Terry and not Howie, but Terry and all these guys, are they work their asses off. They put so much work in. You can't imagine how much work like Howie Long puts in, man. It's unbelievable. The film that he watches, and stuff, like he doesn't stop. So use the same work ethic that got I've you to seen, be a whole thing. I've seen it. Uh, right. And I, I totally get it. And I think that's... And we've seen it both ways. You've seen guys fail because they don't do it. Right. Well, there's there's, there's been plenty of guys mm-hmm. that just, you know, I'm I'm just going to come in and do this and, and I'm who I am and it'll work. Right. It, it doesn't work like that. And um, I'm with you though. Like, I, I think, I also think sometimes with superstars, 
I always try to remind them like, hey, just realize anything that seems mundane and of course right. to you, I don't know. I, right. I, I never right. played. I, and most people, 98% of the people at home don't know it either. So for that to you, that's fascinating. Like when yeah. we're doing the, like for NFL, we're doing these games and, you know, the broadcast is driven by the analyst, you know, the analyst's thoughts going into the week, what they think, what they watch on film. And we build so many ideas and thoughts based on that. Mm-hmm. Of course, we all contribute, but that's the idea. And like, so there's plenty of times during the week I ask stupid questions to Olsen because I'm like, Greg, like, you know, I, I watch this. Does this make sense? Or is that right? Or what do you think? And then he goes on that. He loves it so much. So he goes on this. I'm like, and I'm like, that's fucking awesome. We should right. do during the game. So it's like their their brains are just so what yeah. they've seen and what they know. I agree. They're so cool. And like, I, that's part of trying to extract it and like letting everybody yeah. at home hear it. Cause it's fat. Like I, I love the stuff offline as much as I do online. Yeah. Like when we and, do they, these- and they think it's, they think it's like, you're right. Like, Oh, that me as an insider, they'll go, Oh, that's a big deal. Oh yeah. It's a big deal. Like when I broke the, the story about the Eagles changing their defense coordinator without anybody knowing first guy who told me, he just happened to talk about it in conversation. And I was like, what do you mean, Matt Patricia, the way he's calling it? He's like, yeah, yeah, Matt, Matty P is now the defense coordinator. No, Sal's not doing it anymore. And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah. Hold on. Back. He's like, yeah, you don't know that? I'm like, no, I don't think anybody knows that. Oh, I, well, I don't know. I don't pay attention to who knows what. And it's like, hold, 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 let's back up here for a second. Right? They don't, they don't like you and I look at things as a big deal. A lot of times they don't realize it. I know. It's, and we got we to pull it out of them. That, that, I know, but that's what I think that's kind of the fun of the job, right? Yeah. It, it's that's and honestly, I love the I just love the personality. Like I like to go back to Jeter talking about Jeter. Yeah. I feel like I feel like people got to know him a little bit this postseason. And, you know, that's cool because even my most diehard Yankee fan friends who, you know, had Derek Jeter posters on their wall when right, they were right, kids. Right. They didn't really know him. And like by watching the show, it's the same thing with you guys on Sunday. Like they know you, right? They they they're they feel like they're friends with you. That's the cool thing about what we yeah. do. No doubt. All right, last question to you. I ask all my guests this. Yeah. Give me your unbreakable moment. This is a mental wealth podcast. We're trying to build people up. The way I've been built up is going through really, really, really hard things or a lot of adversity. Adversity is a gift. Give me the one thing that could have broken you or should have in your career, your life, anything, but didn't. And as a result, you came through stronger for the rest of your life. Yeah, I, I mean, it's, I think I could go with a couple different answers here, but, you know, I, I will say, um, I'm, I, I will say, I still think it is the car selling situation for me. And there's a couple of reasons because you just question everything about your existence. You know, you get to the point, you're like, you know, like I woke up one day, I'm like, what the fuck am I like? What am I doing? Am I wasting my time? What What is the what? Where am I going? What am I going to be like? All of that. You question your existence. So this is not like you know, you know, I'm I'm not a young kid at this point. I mean, I'm late in my twenties. I'm 29 years old or whatever, and just like you know, completely have no idea what I'm doing, what I've done the last 10 years of my life, what the next five minutes of my life are going to look like, and that's a scary place mm-hmm. when you're there and when you really don't know. Um, and I think you're also like, you know, you you have these dreams and you you want to experience any dream you have, whatever it is, traveling, work, social life, whatever. I think when you start trying to like say, I'm not a big like, okay, where do you want to be in five years? Because like if you don't, if you're not doing exactly what you think in five years, then you feel like you're a failure. I'm just not not into that idea. Like I think it's one thing to have like hopes and dreams and goals, but to put a timetable on it, everybody's journey is different. And so that year, I just really questioned everything. And I just was, I just really didn't know what I was doing or who I was going to be. And I think there was a point midway through it where I just said, you know what? Screw it. I'm just going to be who I am. And if it works out, it works out. And if it doesn't, I'll be happy finding whatever way that is. And when I did that, that's when everything started to happen because I took all the pressure off my shoulders. I took all the expectation off my shoulders. I just, went out and did what I wanted to do and what made me happy and what I thought I could do. And it's funny when you take all that pressure and dust it away, that's when things become a little simpler and they're not as stressful and you don't get as anxious over, over these little things that were driving you wild and making you not sleep at night. 
And so I, I really do think, obviously, that was a turning point in my career, but I, it, it's not even that. It's just a turning point for how I was dealing with life and how I was dealing with my own set of expectations, because it just allowed me to rethink that. I still had the expectation, Glaze, and I still you know, had my dreams, but I just thought about approaching them in a different way. And, and I think, um, well, I, I know I wouldn't be here today. You know, I, I really get excited talking about it, too, because I want people to use that as a motivation. I've had people tell me that is the cool thing about doing the Super Bowl last year is because I'm not a name and I wasn't a name and I came from a small college and, you know, a small family and the East coast. And, and I came from nowhere basically. And I loved doing the press because I had a lot of, especially like college students or people that have been even in the business or in another business for a long time. It's like, you know, that was so refreshing to hear that you just hung with it and did your own thing and, and, you know, persevered. But I think even if it doesn't work out, I think it's just having that state and you being in that mental state is the only way to go. And so it, it took me till I was almost 30 to get there. Wow, man, that is beautiful. Brother, I am proud to call you a teammate. I'm proud to call you Fox family, but I am definitely proud to call you a brother. Love you, brother. You Love know you that. Too, You're man. the best. I appreciate you so much. Kevin Burkhart, make sure you catch him this weekend on Fox. Love you, bro. Love you.